what do you think why do you think so many people have that mindset attitude towards copywriting as being like hey the people that are actually saying they're doing it at a high level or lying or whatever other shit they come up with i don't know if it's strictly because of copywriting i think it's just yeah. people in general especially people who are new and getting into it they just simply don't understand the magnitude and like what's really good because it's like I, I always talk about this with copy. Like if you're selling a biz op thing and trying to say, okay, I could teach you how to make 10 K a month sure. before you even convince them of that, you have to convince them that making 10 K a month is possible awesome. yeah. in general, just not even like, cause oh, cause a lot they, of they, they live in a world where that's an impossible number, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. And, and I, like, I remember being in that world back in the day. And here we are. Hello, welcome to the Chris, Mr. Moneyfingers Hat Ad Show, along with my good friend, uh, Justin Goff. Hi, Justin. How are you, my friend? What's up, man? How are you? Uh, good. Good to see you. So you're you're retiring, right? You're going to like go to Florida and start playing golf all the time or what? Like what's the what's are, what's going on here? Please explain it. You shocked the entire copywriting world when you came out last week and said you're selling your half of Copy Accelerator. So let's get a scoop. Come on. Yeah. So, um, honestly was not expecting it. It was not anything we were planning. Um, it kind of just came up, uh, Steph and I were exploring, bringing on other partners. Um, we had a few things where we just fundamentally kind of didn't see eye to eye on sure, how to, course. how to run a company, just pretty mm -hmm. natural stuff that happens with Our partners. partnerships are always tough. No yeah. matter who you're doing it with, yeah. <laughs> They're like a marriage with a lot more money involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it depends on who you are, how much you have. But sure, but it's it's uh, it's definitely a. Uh, I I always like to be. I always tell people like I will. I either want to have fifty one or forty nine, but I don't want to be fifty fifty. Generally speaking, because I want somebody <laughs> to be able to make the fucking decision at the end of the day. Uh, nice. Maybe that's just me though. I don't know. So you guys were like, you just were kind of butting heads a little bit for business stuff, which happens. You know, that kind of happens, and you decided that it was a time to exit for a while. Or what's what was the the moment that you were like, hey, maybe it's time for this massive life change. Yeah. So, I mean, really, I like to always look at all options. So when we started talking about bringing on another partner, I started exploring, all right, what is this the right partner? Should we bring on a different partner? And I was like, should we even be partners? Should I buy Stefan out? Should Stefan buy me out? So I kind of started exploring all the options. Um, and one thing that's always been a goal of mine is to be financially independent by the time I was 40. So I'm 38 yeah, awesome. now. And I wanted to be at the point where I could kind of either walk away from stuff that I'm doing or dramatically scale back on it. Yep. Um, one of my biggest passions is dog rescue stuff. So I do a lot of work with them, helping them with fundraising, uh, do stuff in person, just walking dogs and stuff like that, that I truly enjoy, but there's not really a whole lot of money in that. Yeah, um, so that was really been weighing on me a lot over the last, I would say four or five months where I know this is something I really want to do. It's something I want to do more of. I want to put more time into it. Um, but when you're running a multi-million dollar business with live events and tons of people that you're coaching, that tends to just kept getting pushed to the side. And I, I kind of had this realization, this kind of deep thought where I was like, how much money is, is really enough? Yep. Um, it's something I, I've probably thought about a lot over the last year. And I've really just kind of contemplated, do I need to keep making money if I'm kind of at the point where I could live off what I have now? Um, and what, what is the point of me? If I add another million dollars to my net worth, what is, is that going to materially change things in my life? Is it not? Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of that stuff was really weighing on my mind and I kind of started running all the numbers and I was like, I kind of hit my enough but you, is enough. I mean, you don't live like a big rich guy life, right? Like you're, you're kind of, I mean, you, have, you have a nice enough, enough, a nice place or whatever else. But like, I feel like you and I are similar in our attitude towards money because in this business, you and I certainly both know lots of people who are like, I want to make a hundred million dollars. I want to make a billion dollars. I want to do that. I want to do this. I've never been that person. I never, you never really struck me as that kind of person either. For me, money is just like safety and I get to live the life I want to live. I couldn't care less about the, like the social status aspect of it, I guess, or, or I, I don't personally need that kind of a, a beginning of my ego based on money. I've never felt like you really did either. No, I haven't. I, I, it's always been kind of a, uh, actually I take that back. I did, I did more when I was younger. Like I really had, yeah. I wanted to make five or 10 million a year, but I never had any like rationale as to why I wanted to, I just thought it'd be cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, sure. then, yeah. but also though, that's one of those things, going back to what you said with kind of 
I probably, I live on around like 200 grand a year, which might sound like a lot of money to a lot of people. But when I was making between one and a half and 2 million a year, that's actually pretty small amount of money. Yeah, when I, I was to, making like two and a half or so, and I still, I still lived off 200 grand a year and just saved as much as I humanly could. Uh, basically the first year I made seven figures, I saved seven figures, which I've always, nice. been, I've always Smart. been quite proud of quite honestly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's an anomaly in our world because I, yeah. we, we say this all the time, especially with like people who get, I, I, I fell into this trap, right? When I got my first kind of taste of success, yep. I remember when I first hit six figures, like I was trotting along doing like 20 grand, 30 grand a year, all that for a couple of years. As and a copywriter finally, or doing something else? Like I was you... doing affiliate marketing oh, at okay. the time. Yeah. And then I got to six figures. And when I got to six figures, I made the mistake that everybody makes. Like all my expenses went up at the same rate. And I'm yeah. like looking at my bank account and it hasn't I'm like, how the hell am I making four times what I used to make? Yeah. And I don't have any more money. Yeah. Um, it's but all my expenses make, it's went up. Cheap, my friend, as you know, yeah. Yes. It's like yes. gross num gross numbers don't matter either. It's the net one that matters. <laughs> right. Gross gross is like the dick measuring contest yeah, between totally. between business owners and what you actually take home. Yeah. Yeah. What you actually take home. Amex matters. points because you bought a lot of traffic. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It could yeah. be. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I was at. Um, decided to do the deal. Um, Steph and I came to a quick agreement in literally like a week. Um, probably the easiest, most non, uh, I don't know, fighting type buyout yeah. there's probably ever been in history. It was just like, I was like, here's how much money I want. And if you want to do that, let's do it. And he's like, okay, sounds good. Damn, uh, the dude. lawyers draw it up. Let's, oh, yeah, okay. So that's wow, cool. Wow, man. That's freaking awesome. Um, I think it's interesting. I, I love that you're, you talk so much about like the passion aspect of what you're kind of doing next. Like A of all, I love the fact that you, you're you smart enough at your age, you're 38, I'm 44, uh, to be like, hey, you know, again, you know, making another million, making another 5 million, making another 10 million isn't going to change your life or make your life better in any particular way. You're not going to, somebody asked me once they were, a while ago, they were like, Chris, if you had got a hundred million dollars tomorrow, what would you do? And I'd be like, I'd put it away and I wouldn't tell anybody that that that's what I would do. Right? Like, I don't, I don't need anybody to kind of, kind of know that thing. Like, how do you feel about the ethical let's, let's talk about ethics and marketing and ethics and direct marketing, because I, I okay. know talking to you about this and having you talk about wanting to go do the dog rescue stuff and feeling better about that. It makes me feel, and I've had similar conversations with some other people recently too, actually. Yeah. yeah Brad Howard and I were talking about something uh, similar recently, like feeling as you get a little bit older, this just, not being willing or not not feeling good about doing things that you're not ethically interested in anymore, right? When I was in my late 20s and early 30s and never made a dime in my entire life, I would take pretty much any job somebody brought to me because I was like, fuck, man, I just kind of want to make some money. And that was the focus on it. And then as you get older and you spend more time in it and hopefully get a little bit of money underneath you, I think the ethical sides can kind of get to you. Have you experienced that a bit in your career in, in working in direct marketing for quite a while now? I, I would say for me, it was more... Um... So like when I ran my supplement company in 2014 to 2017. Yeah. Patriot Power Greens. Yeah. yeah, we did great. We built it up to 23 million, me and my partner, Alan. Yeah. And when I got to the end of that kind of three years and he bought me out there, I was kind of at the point where I just wasn't that, like we we're selling supplements. Like it's not something I was like, passionate about I don't know anyone of... who's passionate about selling supplements I don't no. I don't I honestly don't know anyone who if you get them drunk enough and get them behind closed doors actually believes in the supplements they're selling I don't know anybody who actually is I mean maybe Patriot Power Greens or Athletic Greens or something like that that feels less scummy than a lot of the other stuff does to me because I think they're being more honest about their promises but gen general I just think most people see the supplement business as some kind of cash machine and not much else I mean that's what it is it, it is yeah. a cash machine um <clears throat> but I, I think when, once you kind of have the money side handled and you, you learn how to make a good amount of money, then you do start to venture off and like, okay, how could I make the same amount of money doing something that I'm I really into? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'm, I also agree with you, like the, the ethics and the, the moral lines and direct response, like it, it, you do get kind of jaded as yeah. a copywriter and a business oh, yeah. owner. Cause it's like, I know what they're going to buy and it's basically some push button thing that they're not going to do anything with. And 90% of the people who buy this aren't, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard not to get jaded when you start to realize 
90 percent of the people that buy your shit don't use it or well, do you anything know the john with it. carlton story about refunds the, there was a famous john carlton story from years and years ago where they i think had, i do but i'll yeah. let you tell it they had an offer uh and it was a, a martial arts thing i believe where they were sending tapes out in martial arts and uh, all of a sudden this offer had like a 20 percent refund rate or something which was insane it was like the highest because for physical thing right it's not like it's a digital thing and they're trying to figure out what it is they're trying to figure out why the refund rate is like 15 20 percent and eventually they figure out it's that every single tape was blank. Like the, act, the dubbing did not happen and that every single tape they sent out was blank, which means 80% of people who got a blank tape didn't do anything about it, right? They probably didn't even notice. They just bought it, it showed up at their house, they put it on the, on the shelf like most people do with info products, I think, and, and that was kind of it, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I got, yeah. I have tons of products I've bought, books I've bought, or. They just sit on my shelf. I've never opened them. Never went through them. I always love when people have those um, the, the books behind them on their Zoom kind of thing, and they have like the entire wall of books. And I'm like, you haven't read any of those. I know there's actually a company that will sell you books by the foot. They're actually called booksbythefoot.com. Nice. And you can go to them and you can say, here's my political beliefs and here's the kind of thing that I want behind me. And they will send you books priced by the foot that you can just put into a bookcase behind you so you can look smart on Zoom. That's brilliant, actually. It really is. I think it's an amazing, I mean, they started off as a business that was just really about um, you know, television and film productions, right, basically. And then when the pandemic hit, they managed to pivot because all of a sudden everybody was mm. on Zoom all the time and they, they did pretty well with it. I thought it was a great example of somebody just taking <laughs> advantage of what's going on in the world for their business. Smart, super smart. Yeah. What, um, how do you think you're just going to go away from marketing for a long time? Do you think this is kind of a temporary thing? I mean, obviously you're quite young still. I mean, I kind of took five or six years away for health reasons and then kind of came back in. Do you think this is just kind of the, you've made your money in this business and you want to go off and do something else? Or this is just like, hey, it's time to take a break, celebrate the success you've had and see what happens next. So it's something I've, I've given a lot of thought to. And one thing I really settled on is like, I'm very much the type A high achiever mm -hmm. kind of person. And I was actually watching a YouTube video the other day of some guy. Um, I have all these like retirement videos coming up now. But the one guy, he had some really good one thing he mentioned in it that really clicked with me. He's like, if you're the kind of type, type A ambitious high achiever person, He's like, the idea that you're just going to be able to retire and turn that off is just a pipe dream. Sure, he's like, it's yeah. just not how it works. Um, so he's like, a better strategy is just to shoot for just scaling back to like 20, 30% of, of kind of what you're doing. Um, and that, that really kind of resonated with me. And, and I was kind of already thinking along those lines anyways. So kind of more now um, I'm focused on, there's some stuff like I've always, like I've always wanted to do an email mentorship thing where I can do more one-on-one -on -one stuff that... Mm -hmm in the context of me doing it with like copy accelerator, it wouldn't be scalable and it wouldn't make enough money to make it worth it for the, there'd totally. be better time yep. would be better spent on other things. Yep. Um, but in the context of me just kind of doing stuff solo and like, maybe I only want to make 150 grand a year, just kind of doing a few select projects, yep. then I can do it. So it's, that's probably what I'll be doing is just figuring out kind of projects that I've always kind of wanted to do. And, mm -hmm just never kind of really fit in the context of, of what I was doing before. So that's what kind of what I'm looking to do. hours were you working more recently? I mean, with Copy Accelerator and everything else, were you working like a 40 hour week or a 90 hour week or, or what? What was your, your, what was that like for you? So it was big ebbs and flows. So like leading up to events, those kind of two months before the event mm -hmm. got pretty hectic usually. Um, just trying to sell tickets to the event, trying to yeah. do everything to get the event set up. Even though we have a whole team doing all that, it's, they're a lot. Um, so I would say leading up to the events, it was more like a 40 hour week. Other than that, I'm usually at, I would say five hours a day. So probably 25 a week. That's about perfect. I feel like, yeah, that's kind of the, the level I, I like to be at. And I, I, I like to, I like to have a lot of freedom throughout the day too. Like if yeah. I was one of those people who had a calendar that was just chocked full from eight to yep. 4 PM, yep. I, I would dread my week every week. Um, that just, yeah, I, I like a lot more freedom wearing. I went from having nothing choose. on my calendar for literal years. And then in the last month or two, it's been like, I've got stuff most days from like 8 AM to 1 PM or so it's been quite a, quite a, sh it's fun right now. I think I'll get, I'll get bored of it and want to change things up at some point, but it's interesting having not had like actual responsibilities for so long to be like, Oh wait, I actually have to be somewhere at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. That used to happen <laughs> 
Were you working when you were building the Patriot Power Greens business? Were you were you like hustling a lot then? Were you working really crazy hours? Yeah, that's when I that was the first time I ever burn out, like seriously burn out, yeah. where I was doing the seven days a week, 12 hours a day thing. Um, and it, I always say like it works until it doesn't. Yeah. And it, you just get to the point where you can't press the gas pedal anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where I was when, when we had our buyout in 2017. Yeah. Uh, I remember at first, like, I was actually really. <laughs> Alan offered to buy me out and like, I was actually like very defensive. I was like, fuck you. I built this company. <laughs> <laughs> and then later you're like, you're doing me a huge favor, man. <laughs> very, just a very stupid response. Um, and then I like thought about it more and more. And one of the guys I talked to who kind of gave me some advice who had sold a company before he was like, he's like, dude, you're 33. He's like, yeah. you got a chance to get multiple millions of dollars right now. And he's like, he's like, I don't really sense that you're that passionate about this anyways at this point and i was like basically yeah every, everything you said was true um but yeah I, I definitely hit burnout at that point um it actually took a full year off after oh, that wow. that's awesome yeah which was one of the things that so i talked to four different people who had sold a company and i was just yeah. like what should i expect uh what'd you do that you wish you had done different blah blah mm -hmm. blah and the one thing that was in common with all four of them they either said I'm super grateful for the time I took off afterwards, yep. or I wish I would have took more time off. Fair. And all these guys sold their companies for way more money than I did. And I was like, all right. Sure. And I, I had this whole plan of like a, the new company I was going to start like on day one, right after the buyout ended. Oh, man. Yeah. And so I was ready to just hop right back in. And then after talking to all those guys, I was just like, okay, I was like, I'll give it at least four to six months and I'll try that. Um, that wound up going on about a year around it, around the year mark is when I started to get the itch to like do something. I started to get bored. Yeah. Um, but it was crazy to realize how addicted to work I was because I mean, literally the next day after I got a multi-million dollar buyout, I was up and at my computer at seven 30 and oh, like, man. just, I'm like, yeah. I know I'm supposed to be here. What, <laughs> what should I be doing? Um, and nobody's talking to you. Cause they're like, well, you don't work here anymore, dude. <laughs> I mean, it, it took me, it took me a good six weeks to yeah. not, to not feel guilty about not working. Like what, I what finally did you do with that time. What did you do with that year? I mean, if you've been busting your ass for years before that you sell the company, you're working crazy fucking hours. And then all of a sudden that's a gone. What did you do with yourself? So I learned to, A, I started sleeping a little more. That was, that was nice. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't beat that. Um, and then just stuff I'd always enjoyed, like me and my dogs would go to the park and instead mm -hmm. of being there for a half hour, we would stay for an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, so like longer stuff like that, I would meet friends for lunch and we'd hang out and have lunch for two hours. Like something that I was, I would never do when I kind yeah. of working, like I, I don't have time for a two hour lunch. I always, um, I always feel like the perfect balance, you know, people talk about the dignity of work and how you have to work and things like that. And I always say like, when I didn't work for several years, I felt really good about it. It's nice to not have to, right? It's nice to be able to just kind of do whatever you want to. And personally, I feel like the main issue is that the balance that people try to do is so bullshit. I think like if I could just work four or five hours a day and have the rest of the time to do whatever, that's fucking perfect for me. If I had to work eight or nine or 10 a day, I'd be miserable all the time. And the work wouldn't be any good anyway. I, I think especially with like what we do with creative work, like th there is a real ceiling on it. Yeah. Like the idea that you're going to be able to write copy or come up with ideas for eight or nine hours a day is just just grind away at it like you're a, like you're a factory worker kind of putting widgets together yeah it just it doesn't really work with what we do did it did it change when you when you sold your first company and now that you're selling your second one did it mess with your identity at all i mean so often you talk to people um i was talking about howard about this like you know you become so identified with a certain level of income and with being a person who accomplishes certain things right like like this is what you do do you feel like that was a difficult thing for you to move away from the first time or or the second time where you just really not care about the ego side of this the most difficult thing for me and the biggest worry was could i do it again yeah. i had a lot of fears around I mean, despite all the success I had had, yeah. um, I really had a lot of fear around, was I just like a one hit wonder? Did I just yeah, get totally. lucky on this? Um, so a lot of that really crept in and I know there's a lot of coaches out there that, um, I forget the one guy's name who teaches a bunch of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Um, but he, he always talks about after you sell your company, like he advises not taking a break because, because of that, because he's like yeah. that, that creeps in all the time with every entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, it, it was one of those big things where I was like, I, I had to get past it. Um, I had to just kind of 
just be a little more realistic about, okay, like I wasn't, a, I've built multiple seven figure businesses. I've done yeah. this for, I don't know, 15 years at that point. Like, yeah. it's not like I just got lucky and wrote one off for that. I think it's that, that time for me, you know, because again, I got really sick for a long time, didn't really do any offers for a while. You knew me back when I was kind of crazy for quite some time and not really myself. But like, eventually, I had to learn that I didn't have anything to prove anymore. Right? Like, even if I hadn't done an offer that was huge in several years for different reasons, that didn't change the fact that I still had done all of this stuff in the past and have the ability to do those things in the future. But I never would have gotten there if I was still on that treadmill, if I was still pumping out offer after offer, if it was still succeeding. Like, I really feel like either, like failure is always a great educator, but also just being forced to step away from what you identify as is a really valuable thing. I think it's, I'm so glad I went through that experience in my, you know, 30s and early 40s. And I mean, it, it's really common, like all of us, I feel like in this space, definitely get a good chunk of our kind of self-worth from Absolutely. the yeah. business and the money we make. And it's not any different than guys who get it from having a beautiful wife or having a sweet car. Yep. I, I think it's, it's okay. To, people as possible, you know, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's okay to get some of your worth from what you do, but when you're at the point where it's like, that's like 90% of your worth. Yeah is all external. That's just a really shaky ground to be on because that could be pulled out. Then when it's taken away, who are you? Yeah. You're not that person who is making uh, X number of X amount of money or whatever it is. Who are you? That can kind of be devastating for people. I think the main thing I've had to learn is just learning how to be like, you're okay. Just being you, even if you're not doing something for anybody or whatever else, even just learning to like, just hang out and not do anything. It took me the longest time to learn to not do anything. Instead of having my brain go at a billion miles an hour all the time. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna do any travel or anything now that you're you're free of all this stuff or what? Um, I got a couple of things going for the next couple months. Um, just even small things that like those things that you never get around to when yeah. you got a to do list that's a hundred things long. Like yeah, absolutely. my sister just had a baby like a year ago and I still haven't seen the baby. It's like mm -hmm. okay. Oh, wow. need... well, yeah, there's a whole pandemic and other things. It seems travel's been a bit of a pain for a while now. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, I need to go see the baby. Um uh going to see my parents. Um, I'm gonna be in Vegas. I teach on this personal development program every summer where I teach kind of the business entrepreneurship portion. So I'm gonna do that in August. Is that for teenagers or something, or for or for what? Or is it for no, it's like a a whole scale thing for guys that basically covers like inner work, entrepreneurship, fitness, dating, kind of the whole thing. Oh, so it's like a masculinity thing or like being a good man, being a... It's basically how to be a better man type yeah. thing. And cool. uh, I teach the entrepreneurship kind of business portion of it uh, last couple of years, which is really fun to see. That's awesome. That sounds super fun. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Mm -hmm. Um, If you get like, here's a, here's a, a standard question. If you could go back to when you were first getting started, actually, did you have a, I know, I know your background, you were really short in high school, right? You had that whole, <laughs> for people that don't know, can you please tell the, tell the story about your massive growth spurt? And I, I, I always find, we've talked about this before, the perspective shift that caused for you going from being a short guy, cause you're yeah. six one extra. So I think you're about my height now, but not before that you, what was it was like six months, six inches, eight inches in a year or something. More than that. So I graduated high school. I was five, one, 110 pounds. Uh, <laughs> so I was the short guy my whole life. Just assumed I was always going to be the short guy. I'd never yeah. really had any hope of being the tall guy or even like normal height. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I've always come from that mindset and I had a big ass chip on my shoulder about that. Like a lot of short guys do. Yeah. Um, and then Basically, my end of my freshman year of college, I grew about eight inches, and then the year after that, I grew about three inches. Wait, wait, what was? But what caused that? Like, did you go to a doctor, and they like, like was it some kind of hormonal thing, or did somebody in, like install a chip into you? Were you <laughs> were you in Gattaca and they stretched your shins? Like, I've never heard of. I've just never heard of somebody just normally having like. Did your dad go from like four feet tall to nine feet tall when he was a kid? No, so it definitely wasn't normal. So I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was sixteen. Oh, okay. And so that is, I went through like the whole process of like, I mean, I was like 90 pounds at the time and I lost 20 pounds because of Crohn's. So I was like 70 pounds in high school, like a little like wow. sunken in. Yeah. So the Crohn's disease definitely stunted my growth. Um, and for a couple of years, just, um, yeah, I, I didn't grow. So I eventually did grow. 
Um, but then I was like that awkward kid who was like six foot, 120 pounds, who just yeah. like yeah. kind of like a puppy who just doesn't know how to use his limbs yet. One of yeah, those. Like, tall, but brittle, right? <laughs> like somebody half your height could take you out in a fight pretty easily because there's just nothing, nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, um, uh, I'm glad I did grow though, because oh, yeah. height. Yeah, that's that'd be a very different life if I was five one still. It's a I mean, it is a totally different thing. I mean, being a I'm I'm you know being a tall white man in America is pretty damn easy in general. But you also get like the 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 difference how you get treated as a guy between being like five nine and six one. I think is pretty profound. But honestly, it was very pro. One of my this is a funny story. So my buddy Alec, who is one of my uh, copywriting mentees, um, mm -hmm. so Alec's like six six, looks like he's like a freaking male model from LA. Mm -hmm. And we were talking one time and just dead serious, dead serious. He was like, I feel like my life would have been so different if I was six, seven. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> of six, six. And I'm just like, he's like, he's like, there's a lot of guys that are like six, five, six, six, but like six, seven is a different level. And I'm just looking, I'm like, every dude that's like five, nine wants to just fucking rip your balls off right I've now. I've joked before about wishing I was six, three instead of like six, one and a half. Right. Just, <laughs> but mostly just to be obnoxious, not because I actually want to be that much taller. Like, I feel like you and I we're like, we're Captain America height, which I always think is kind of the perfect height. Like where you're like, you're tall, but it's not what defines you as a human being, as opposed to when you're like six, five, six, six, it's like, oh, being tall is your thing. That's kind of kind of yeah like, you're the tall guy if you're six five yeah exactly that's like your defining characteristic what was it like for you i mean how did it affect let's just talk about this one how did it affect your relationship with women when you gained all that height it must have been i mean it's a known thing most women do not particularly want to date some, a guy who is shorter than them unless the guy has a ton of confidence and can really handle that and doesn't doesn't take it as a thing himself how did that affect that part of your life um i would say a combination of that and then just college in general brought me out of my shell a little bit yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely was much better with women when I was in college than I was in high school. Yeah. Um, although this is, I always think back to this in junior high, I was actually amazing with women. Like I was always oh, yeah. dating. Yeah. I was dating like the best looking girl who was like two years older than me. And like, nice. yeah, I was trying to figure out, I'm like, I don't know what happened from there to high school, but <laughs> <laughs> something went wrong in between there, but college. Yeah. I would say that definitely changed. Um, although it's interesting, like Cause I still, I had a lot of anger from being the short guy who kind of always got teased and picked on. Um, did, you have even, when, did you have many friends were you, when you were a kid or do you think your height kind of created a barrier between you and a lot of people? I was, I was actually pretty popular. Um, but I was also easy to pick on. Um, like I wasn't, I wasn't like, the kid who's like five one hundred pounds, but he's like a badass wrestler. I was sure. like, yeah, five one hundred pounds, little skinny ass dude who anybody could kind of pick on. Um, so I definitely, I definitely did get picked on a lot. Um, and then, yeah, I definitely had a lot. I would say in high school, especially a lot of like you're saying with women, where like yeah. I basically only tried to date girls that were like four foot ten, five one, really? like yeah. which is tiny girls, yeah a small pool of women mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it definitely had a i would say it definitely had a big effect on my upbringing and I, I noticed actually even even today it's interesting i still get triggered in scenarios where if i'm around like a tall dude if i'm yeah. like with a girl i'm dating and i'm around like a guy who's six five and like 220 and he's like talking to her that I, I start to get triggered by that. I can totally see that. I can totally see that. For me, it's just like, you know, I've been tall my entire life, but I had no self-esteem and no self-confidence when I was a kid, right? So like people who know me now know me as this very confident kind of person who will talk to anybody and all that shit, but I still don't really see myself that way. Like I still see myself as who I was. I think we all do that. We all kind of see ourselves as who we are in high school and in one way or another. And it's always strange to have to remember that we're out in the real world now and actual adults. Like, I mean, my, 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 mine's very similar. Like I grew up with a perfectionist mom who just uh -huh. nothing I ever did was good enough. And that's kind of like the quickest path to feeling like oh, you're man. fucking worthless. Was I your mean, dad around? Yeah. Uh, my dad's very much the kind of like puppy dog following my mom around kind of thing. Uh, like just okay. whatever she says, she's like, she's Emperor Putin and whatever she says goes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i mean i can relate to that a lot i, I grew up with very similar kind of thoughts about myself I had really no confidence in myself no self-esteem like yeah big kind of chip on my shoulder against everybody yeah. 
Yeah. What did you want to be when you were a kid? Like when you were growing up, where, where did you go? You grew up in the Midwest somewhere? Where was, what's your, your origin? Was I grew, so I grew up near Cleveland, uh, yeah. in a small town called Sandusky, uh, mm-hmm. kind of town where like everybody knows each other and yeah. people work at the Ford plant or the Verizon store and they all just stay there and marry somebody. That's from where high you school. got that monotone. Is that like, you know, that yeah. blue collar, that, that blue collar <laughs> monotone. We don't raise our voice ever. Yeah. It's great. It's like Sam. Um, uh, yeah, it's crazy too. Cause growing up in that environment, like I remember hearing when I was like, I don't know, I was junior high or high school and my dad worked in this factory that makes rubber for the conveyor belt um coal mining industry type stuff and i remember hearing that something about my dad or the family made like 50 grand a year and and thinking Mm -hmm. like i was like wow like if i could make 50 grand a year i would just be living and i remember one of my buddies his dad was a lawyer and i remember hearing something about he was making like one hundred sixty thousand dollars a year and that just completely blew my mind like he was one of the rich guys and i was like that is insane amount of money um I so I was actually never one of those people though that had like I want to be this when I grow up. Yeah. I mean, I had those stupid like fantasies of like I'm gonna be in the NBA when I was like in seventh grade playing basketball and just when you were five foot when you were like four foot nine. Yeah. Or something like that. Not not realizing I don't have the genetics, no matter how many no, three no pointers I can do, make. Or I'm never gonna be a jockey either. So you yeah. Know. <laughs> um, but I was more just actually watching my dad kind of work that job. I I really was like I just don't want to work in a factory. Um, that was kind of my whole thing. When I went to college, it was interesting because I, I started off as a visual design major mm. and I realized my freshman year of college about halfway through all the kids I lived on the floor with me were all design people. Yeah. And in their spare time, all I did was <laughs> sit on Photoshop and design stuff. And I realized after a couple, I'm like, oh, this is not me. Like I'm out like watching, going to the football games and doing like all, all they care about is this. Yeah. Um, and it was like a super competitive program. And I found, I was like, I'm. I don't think this is actually what I'm cut out for. And so I switched to what is the easiest major at Ohio State University, which is sports and leisure studies. Sports Uh, and leisure studies. Yes. Holy crap. Yes, that's a real major. Uh, It's basically me and like all the guys from the football team in the. the, um, It's made for like if you want to go work in an athletic department or you go work for the city in the parks department. Like that's kind of what it's for. Sure. And I kind of had this, I was like, oh, maybe I'll work for like an NBA team or football team or something. And then that's kind of when I started getting probably my sophomore or junior year of college, when I started making websites and I started learning about affiliate marketing, um, never made a ton of money, but I got to the point where like, while I was in college, like I was making 400, 500 a month Damn, and great. in college, yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh, you're like rich in college with that kind of money. You, that'll pay your rent, you know, if you're near, depending on when year that was and all that kind of shit. Oh yeah. I definitely covered rent back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of the first thing. And I remember when I got to graduating college, I had a job offer at, um, rivals.com, which is this, they were oh, yeah. this big college football recruiting website. Um, I did an internship with them over the summer and helped them with a bunch of their SEO and stuff. And they had, they gave me an offer for like a $60,000 marketing job. Oh. And I basically, I remember telling my, my mom about it and she was just like, no questions asked. You're taking that job. And I was like, I was like, I don't know. I'm like doing this thing with like the affiliate marketing and like, yeah. I'm making like 500 a month. And I, f- I feel like if I put some actual time into it, I could, I could get it to like two grand a month. Yeah. And if I'm making two grand a month, I can live on that. Cause I was living in like a $300 apartment at the time. Yeah. And, uh, opposed to her wishes. I, I went after what I actually wanted. <laughs> she was not happy whatsoever. Uh, was that difficult? I mean, from from describing your mom, it sounds like she was very used to getting what she wanted. Uh, probably yes. you went from everyone was that, that must've been, was that a big deal for you to be able to stand up to her for that kind of thing? Yes. I mean, I, I'm probably the only one in the family who actually has done that. Wow. Um, everybody else just kind of follows along with, with what she wants. Mm-hmm. And I definitely did growing up. Um, but I also having that, never having that kind of sense of safety and security kind of growing up, I think yeah. really propelled me to do my own thing. Cause that was how, that was what I saw was like the only way to really figure things out. I was like, I, I need to kind of do this on my own. Um, I know that feeling actually, because me, uh, the way I grew up, you know, my dad was a, my dad was a, a salesman. He was always kind of out of the house. My mom was clinically depressed for a long time. 
uh, I was on my own, right? It was just like, like the thing that I learned as a kid that has taken me an entire lifetime to try to get away from is this idea that I have to do everything myself and that you can never rely on anybody for anything. It's taken me literal decades to learn how to be like, okay with Angie getting me something from the fridge. Cause I'm so used to always being the person that has to do it all myself. I, I, I relate a lot to that. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't need anybody's help. Yeah. Like a very kind of needless kind of view of everything where I can do it on my own. I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's one of those things that it, it probably helped you a lot in the beginning with your business because you're Some like ways, yeah. super independent, yep. but it also has its barriers. Well, the issue that what I tell people is like, it's not that it, I don't want to ask for help. It's not that I'm like not asking for help to be tough. It's that it literally never occurs to me. Wow. Yeah. Like it just does not enter. It's, it's better now, but for the longest time, it simply would never enter my brain that I was allowed to be like, Hey, I'm having a hard time. Can somebody help me out with this? Just cause of the way I, my particular brain works and all that kind of shit. No fun. That makes sense. Yeah. I, yeah definitely relate to that. Yeah. Um, but going back to kind of where we were talking about it, it was really interesting when I, cause I, you see this with a lot of entrepreneurs where it's like their parents, the friends, the people that are like closest to them are like, you can't do the, it. The least supportive. Um, I and that, so, whenever I write for that niche, I put that in the copy. There's always the bit that where you're like, I talk about like shutting up your brother-in-law who thinks you're wasting your time or your brother or your dad or whatever it is. Yeah. It's, it's so true too. Cause it's, it's like, that's the person you're thinking is going to be supportive of you and like, oh yeah, you should go out. And I, I have friends who like tell stories like that. They're like, oh yeah, my dad was super encouraging of me to be an entrepreneur. And I was like, man, what was that like? <laughs> like my For me, mom it's was like when like, people say my they mom go was here. like my biggest <laughs> For me, it's like when people say they go to their parents for advice, right? And for me, just the way I grew up, in, like, again, I love my mom. She's awesome. She's a great person now, but she was rough back then. And my dad died a long time ago. But the idea that you would like go to your parents for advice is absurd to me. I'm like, no, they don't know what they're doing. They come to me for advice. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, I, I have similar. I, yeah, I don't have that kind of relationship with my parents where I, I, I ask. I, I'm even now at the point where it's kind of a distant thing where it's yeah. like, because I'm 38 now and my mom up until three years ago still tried to like control every aspect of my life. And it's oh like, if you're going to keep doing that, like we're, we're putting some distance between us and good for you for setting some boundaries. Have you ever managed to have a conversation mm -hmm. with her about kind of the childhood stuff? Like my mom and I sat down six or seven years ago at a bar and just like actually talked about what it was like when I was in high school and she was depressed and it was, it was a very chaotic, emotionally violent kind of messed up kind of situation, but it was so, imagine. it was so amazing to just have her be like, Hey honey, I'm sorry. Right. Cause she was, she was dealing with her own mental illness stuff and depression at the time and, and whatever else, but just having somebody listen and just be like, yeah, I hear that I was not able to be there for you or be the parent that you needed me to be was incredibly powerful for me at the time. It let, it let me let a whole bunch of stuff go. Yeah. I mean, so it's interesting that you say that because I've thought of that, but my mom is the type who will never apologize and admit she's wrong. They're just a rationalization for everything. It's like, yeah. well, this was going on and this was, and I thought you did, but like, that's, I've always kind of like gotten to the point where like, I was hoping that would change and we would have a better relationship. Um, it sounds like she's scared, right? It's like people that are afraid to admit they're wrong. Usually that has something to do with their own self-worth, right? Or like the way I grew up Catholic in Massachusetts, it was very much like, if you ever admitted you were wrong, that means you were wrong about everything, right? right. That means that you were a piece of shit about everything. Much like my ex-wife too is one of those people who like, I would gladly apologize to her for many things I did during our marriage that I was, you know, was mentally ill and whatnot. The problem is if I did that, she would see that as her being like, yes, it's all your fault and not mine at all, mm. right? There would be no kind of sharing of the, sharing of the blame or anything like that and suck. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a rough situation. It always so you got out, so you got out of, um, you stood up to your mom, which must have been incredibly uh, harrowing and terrifying and awesome all at the same time. Uh, and then you decided to go off and do the affiliate marketing thing. What happened that kind of transitioned you over from affiliate marketing over to focusing much more on to um, copywriting? So I would say that kind of all hit and so I did a lot in the poker affiliate world and that mm. was in the early 2000s, mid 2000s when the online a lot of hold them or something like, did you ever do yeah. that kind of professionally or whatnot? I didn't play professionally, but I played a, a good amount. Um, and the poker, that, so for people who aren't familiar, the poker boom was like full bloom huge. at that time. It was huge. Yeah. Um, and hold them took over the world for a while. <laughs> it, did, it did take over the world. 
And you could just put your credit card on Party Poker or Poker Stars and sign up with 50 bucks. And as an affiliate, you'd get like a $200 commission. So I built a bunch of like SEO pages for that. Uh, got that to the point where I was doing like 10K a month uh, off of these SEO pages. But then 2000, I think it was 2008. Uh, it was either 2008 or 2009. Uh, it was called Black Monday, I think. Yeah. And basically the government said, you're not allowed to play online poker in the United States anymore. Wow. And basically shut down all the methods of transferring money to a poker site. Um, so like 90% of the market was just gone overnight. Um, so I started thinking about what I was going to do next. And at the time I was working out with this trainer and I was getting really good results. Mm -hmm. And he was basically had me on the paleo diet and we were doing kind of CrossFit style workouts. And this is kind of before paleo and CrossFit kind yeah. of really blew up. Because you only eat meat, right? Like are you still on the meat only diet for your crowns? Right now I'm only on meat. Yes. Meat That's been it for about three years. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but yeah, back then I was getting really good results with that stuff. And I mentioned to him, I was like, I feel like there would be other guys that'd be interested in this, that what we're doing, like it's working really well. Uh, nobody's really got products around this. So we started creating like a blog and products around it. And funny enough, I saw a bunch of direct response pages and I was like, that's the ugliest fucking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Who would ever yeah. buy anything from that page? Always. Yep. And I was like, I'm not doing, we're not doing that. I was like, we'll sell it our own way. And I like tried to do just like your typical kind of e-com style short copy. And basically for like a year, year and a half, tried that and just banging our heads against the wall and not making any sales and nothing was really working. Then I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, we need to try something else. This is not yeah. working. And my partner was, so he was a personal trainer and he was using a ton of Dan Kennedy stuff for his gym to get clients. Yeah. And he handed me a big box of Dan Kennedy DVDs. And he's like, you, he's like, you should watch these. And so I like begrudgingly put the Dan Kennedy uncut DVD in that was like 15 hours and watched oh the God. whole thing. Wow. And I remember just being mind blown by the end of it. I was like, it just clicked. I was like, oh, I was like, I get it now. I see everything we're doing wrong. I see why all these other pages that look like this, why they're designed like this and why they say the words they're saying. Um, so that was a huge kind of turning point for me um, and got me into really just writing copy. So I started writing copy for our own products. I started writing for um, clients as well. Did you have any well. kind of writing background at all? Were you ever a writer when you were younger or was this just, you just got into writing as a way to, to have this particular skill? Yeah, it was more just a means to an end. Um, yeah, I was really, okay, we got to sell these products. How do I do this? I didn't really have the money to go hire. Honestly, I didn't even know you could, I don't even know if I knew you could hire a copywriter at the time. Yeah, I often wonder how I would have gotten my relationship advice business, my Michael Fiore business off the ground back in the day. Like I always say, the reason I was Michael Fiore is I was the cheapest person I could find who would be good at the job, basically, <laughs> right? I couldn't afford to hire anybody else at the time. Uh, and also I could, there's no way I could have hired like a good enough copywriter to be able to write that stuff to get things off the ground. So I feel very lucky to have had the skill myself. So. Yeah. Yeah. How good did you and Alan get hooked up? How did that whole Patriot Power Greens business come together? Because did you ever freelance basically? So you just had your own stuff, but did you ever actually do any freelance? I freelance on it. It was more on the side for me. It was never like full time. And even when I was freelancing though, because I was still doing like, I was still into like blogging. I was still doing SEO. So I kind of did a whole hodgepodge mm -hmm. of things kind of at that time. Um, Alan and I met, he was actually an affiliate for my first offer on ClickBank, which was called the 31 Day Fat Loss Cure. And mm -hmm. We were doing well with that. Um, Surprised you haven't done a how to grow taller product, but your answer would just be. Those are out there. Have you seen them? I, I have seen those before. <laughs> I have. I've seen the copy for those. It's like those and the jump higher ones, right? There's a lot of those kind of things. Magical ways to jump higher. Yeah. Grow taller ones. Um, a buddy of mine actually did. He was doing like bridges and stuff for. I was sitting back bends and all stuff for. I think it was like eight months, and he like showed me his height measurement. He grew like three fourths of an inch. Holy crap. Yeah. And he was like a fully grown man. Like it wasn't like some kid. Who's I always be joke because I've been working on my car wreck injuries for so long and I'm kind of getting, finally getting things lined up properly. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to be at least a half inch taller when I'm done with this. I remember Probably. being, I was six, two back in the day when I was young, I'm trying to get up there again. Someday I'm going to make this happen. Oh, we're, getting, we're getting up. older. So we're starting to squat down a little bit. I know we all, I, gotta, I do a lot of, I do a lot of yoga. I'm trying to maintain my height <laughs> as long as I can. Yeah. <laughs> My, uh, my aunt is really mad because she's finally under five feet. She was really upset about it. She's like, she's like, I'm still five, three. I'm like, no, you're not. You haven't been for a long time, actually. <laughs> that's the thing that's 
is going on for you. So you met Alan as an affiliate. How did you guys decide to get into the supplement business together? So I had started the uh, testosterone. Basically, I was running a bunch of um, emails, cold email traffic on a bunch of the conservative email lists that were really popping at the time. Yeah. And we we're running them for stuff like that. Yeah, like Newsmax, Glenbeck, all that type of stuff. And we were running them um, for this affiliate offer, and it was doing really well. And so I started talking to this other guy I know, Brandon Kelly, who's a big, uh, big player in the survival world now. Um, he was, I was like, why don't we partner together and create our own testosterone offer? Cause we keep promoting these, these other ones and they're doing great. Yeah. And the copy on them honestly was not even that great. So I was like, let's start that. So me and Brandon did that. We grew that to about a million. And then once we got to about a million, Alan sent me an email and was like, Hey, I'm thinking of getting into the health niche. Cause at the time he had the four Patriots survival stuff that was doing really well. Yeah, that's, that's how I first met Alan way back in the day. I think is when he was doing that. Yep. And so he was crushing it with that. And he was like, we, we want to get into the health niche. Um, he's like, would you be interested in coming and working for us? And I was like, no, another erratic <laughs> reaction. Like my first, I was like, no, I'm not going to come fucking work for you. Like I'm like an entrepreneur. I'm not coming to work for you. Um, and then like four days later, I kind of thought about it some more and I sent him a more level headed email. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm about just, I'm just trying to imagine you blowing up, right? Like like me blowing up, people have seen it before. It makes sense. I'm imagining you blowing up would just be like you just you just raise your voice very very slightly. No, because I, I used to be I used to not have any idea of how to emote and say things and bring I would just stuff everything down and then uh, just blow okay. up. Yeah. Um I was very I'm, I'm much better now, but yeah, I was very much that guy who didn't know how to say anything was wrong to my girlfriend, and then two months oh. later I just spew out 300 things that have been on my mind for yeah not not a good way to go through life not at all but good for uh, you for doing the work to kind of move past it because most people do thanks man mm -hmm. yeah so that's where we're at and then i basically was like hey i'm not gonna come i don't want to come work for you but like what do you think if we partner together um you obviously got more money than me so if you put up the money to kind of get this thing rolling like i'll give you a higher percentage um you'd be buying into a company that's already doing a million in sales and kind of off the ground so Alan bought out my partner, Brandon, uh, Alan and I then kind of partnered together and we, we came up with the, the hook and everything for Patriot power greens, which was our big greens powder, which at the time was, there was no really greens powders on like athletic greens was doing yeah. a little bit of stuff, but they, they were like the market a little bit at that point. Yeah. They were like the only one, uh, there was a couple in direct mail that I just mm -hmm. kept getting in the mail all the time. So I was on all those lists and I was like, okay. If these are working in direct mail, but nobody's doing it online, why don't we just absolutely? Yeah. Why don't we just knock one of these off and do what it? Was the, what was the origin of the? I mean, I think it's brilliant that you guys attach it to patriotism and went after like older right wingers and shit like that. That makes total sense from a marketing standpoint. But like, what was the? Who came up with the idea of making it a patriotic themed kind of thing? So I had a. I was thinking through a bunch of ideas. I I understood that market very well. It was. I was like, what are the things? that they really love that we could attach to this that would help it. And it was like, there was like a Ronald Reagan promo at the time that was like doing really well. And I was like, I was like, Oh, he'd be a great thing to attach to it. There's obviously like the religious side that you, and there was a lot of people doing like biblical food stuff. I know you did yep. something around that. Yep. And I was like, what's the other thing? There's other things that they're conservative men and women, they're 50, 60 and seventies that are really into. And I was like, the military is one that Absolutely. no one's really hit on that angle yet. Yeah. So I started really thinking about it. And at the time, my cousin was in the Coast Guard in San Diego. And mm -hmm. so I basically sent his entire unit. We sent him, I don't know, it was like 50 bottles of our green supplement that we got made. Mm -hmm. I was like, yo, share this with all your buddies in your unit. Feel free to give us some feedback on it. Most of the feedback was not even usable because you're not it's just from normal people who like, yeah. oh, it tastes great. And it's like, okay, well, I didn't get to do anything. Yeah, not there actually was, a useful testimonial. Yeah. But there was one in there from a guy that was, I don't know if he was in the Coast Guard Reserve or what. He was like an older dude. So like yeah. most people in the military are 18, 19, 20-year-olds. And he was an older guy. And he was talking about how since he's been taking this for the last month that his PT times have gotten a lot better. He's Ooh. like, not only am I keeping up with the young guys, but I'm beating them in a, in certain like competitions and stuff and like i was just like boom yeah, i was totally like that got it. yeah i was like so i was like there's something around old guys keeping up with young guys yeah. or beating yeah. up on young guys i was like because yeah. i mean that's what every dude in his 60s like this is like fantasy Absolutely. like 
Yeah. I'm going to show this whole punk what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of the well, hook. Those men are so terrified of losing masculine power. I mean, we all are. I'm 44 now too, right? So I get it. But it's like losing masculine power. Same thing when you're doing testosterone supplements, shit like that. It's about, or even when I did the uh, Gorilla Flow one, which is a prostate thing, it's the same thing. It's about the younger guy is catching up to you and you're getting put out to pasture, basically. <laughs> Nice. It's funny. I mean, that, that angle works. Uh, I mean, it works. Everybody was, it was funny too. One of the first angles we tried in that was like how to live to a hundred and it like yeah. bombed. And it, I finally realized I'm like people in their seventies don't want to live to a hundred. They want to be 30. That's what they want. That makes total sense. Yeah. Or they want to be 50. Yeah. Like they, yeah. they don't people in a- their seventies. They know people who are in their nineties and they're like, that looks horrible. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to live like that. That actually seems like a really horrible thing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that was um, kind of how Patriot Power Greens happened. And um, the cool thing with that, that was one of the few offers that I had ever, like we did our first email drop for that. Yeah. And we spent three grand on the email drop and it brought back $15,000. And oh, I was like, crap. I thought something was broken with the tracking. I'm yeah. like, there's, yeah. I've never seen anything like this. Something's got to be wrong. We waited another week, did another buy on Newsmax. And I think the second one we did was like for four grand. And the next one brought back like 16 grand. And I was just like, oh my God, we yeah. hit an absolute yeah. grand slam. Yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, I've, I had never seen anything on that level. Yeah. Um, getting like a four X ROI right out of the gate. No testing. I don't even think we had upsells at the time. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like those were yeah. the days, huh? Those were the days. I remember back in the day, like I would just put a, I would just come up with an offer, put it up on ClickBank. I wouldn't even think about traffic. I would just be like, Hey, look guys, I have an offer. And then all of a sudden it's making 200, 300 sales a day. And we just, that was just it. That's just how it worked back in the day. I didn't even realize how awesome that was back, back when it was happening. I have, so I got a similar story that's funny. So when I launched 31 day fat loss cure, this is 2010. It was a weight loss offer on ClickBank. Yep. Put it up. I'm running Facebook traffic to it. No upsells, uh, literally just straight to the offer. Yeah. And I got it to the point where I was spending like five grand a day on Facebook. That was like capped out my account and it was bringing in about seven grand a day and it was all wow. digital. So I was yeah. profiting like no two grand on the front. Are, yeah. I did nothing else ever with those customers. I did not mail them anything. I did not sell them any other affiliate offers. I did not. I literally thought you were supposed to make all the money on the front end. And then like, that's how it worked. Yeah. I like look back now. I'm like, I left so much money on the table that it's, it's so oh, dude, embarrassing. I was talking to Mike Geary about this a while ago about just like, man, if we knew 10 years ago, what we knew now, we know now, like back when it would be billions of dollars, basically. You'd- probably be retired on the beach in Costa Rica. Have, so I don't like beaches, <laughs> but I would be retired or whatever. Actually, I wouldn't be retired. I'd be too bored to be retired. Uh, here's a question for you. Um, a few years ago, I, I went onto one of those copywriting groups on Facebook and I just did, a, I, I didn't ask me anything, right? I did like a, Hey, I'm a millionaire copywriter. Ask me anything. And some people ask some really interesting questions, but the number of people who are like, there's no fucking way you're a millionaire copywriter. That's impossible. Blah, blah, blah. And these are people that were also like asking questions like, can you even make a hundred thousand dollars a year as a copywriter? And it's such a weird difference in viewpoint from what I've had the entire time I've been in this business and in this career, because I know plenty of people who have kind of crawled to that, um, that, that height of making at least six figures and sometimes making more. Like you've been doing the copy accelerator thing for quite a while now. What do you think, why do you think so many people have that mindset attitude towards copywriting as being like, Hey, the people that are actually saying they're doing it at a high level or lying or whatever other shit they come up with. I don't know if it's strictly because of copywriting. I think it's just people in general, especially people who are new and getting into it. They just simply don't understand the magnitude and like, what's really good. Cause it's like, I, I always talk about this with copy. Like if you're selling a biz op thing and trying to say, okay, I could teach you how to make 10 K a month sure. before you even convince them of that, you have to convince them that making 10 K a month is possible yeah. in general. Just not even like, cause oh, a lot they, of, they live in a world where that's an impossible number, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. And you know, I, remember, like, I remember being in that world back in the day. Yeah. It's, 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 it's kind of going back to my, me, um, when I was in high school thinking 50 K was like a ton of money if you would have told me I could make a hundred thousand dollars writing copy, I probably would have said, no, that, you can only make a hundred thousand. If you're like a lawyer or a doctor, that was, yeah. 
my mindset at the time. Yeah. I didn't really realize. I never thought you could make money as a writer. That's for sure. I would just was like, okay, I'm a, I was, I've always thought of myself as a writer and the idea I could make anything as a writer was impossible to me. And the first time I had like the first time I made 200 grand in a month, personally, it was like my brain exploded because I was like, this makes no sense to me whatsoever that that's even possible or allowed and that I'm not breaking a variety of laws by doing it. <laughs> you feel like, you feel like you walked in and just robbed a convenience store. It was just so weird. I robbed a convenience store that had 200 grand in the till. And I'm like, what kind of convenience store is this in the first place? It was a big, um, did you become kind of a dick when you started making some money or did you kind of manage to avoid that somehow? I don't think I did. Um, I feel like I've always kind of been of the belief that money, money does kind of amplify what you yeah, are. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't think I, I really changed at all. I mean, for me, honestly, it was, I would say it was more kind of almost anxiety inducing. Cause like, mm. especially when I first, I remember when I first started making six figures. Um, I remember being, I was at my parents' house for Christmas, all the family was there and yeah. somehow someone started mentioning that I was, how much money I was making. I have no idea how yeah. they how they knew, but the looks I got from the family of like how much I was making and how I was doing it. And then them like thinking, like what is he actually like selling drugs or like yeah. what is he what is yeah. he actually doing um and even i remember talking about i i think i was right when i got my first assistant mm -hmm. and people give me shit for that like oh, what yeah. do you mean what do you mean you can't do your own work like you need to have an assistant like you can't do that and like it's just such a different way of thinking because it's like you and i would be like of course i have one because there's all these tasks that need to be done that i don't need to be doing and it's not worth my time and to they're do not them. gonna get done if i have to do them either <laughs> That's my, my ex my, my, my ex at one point um and again I, I wish nothing but the best we were not right for each other etc but she would say i she would say i can't believe i married a man who doesn't want to mow his own lawn and i'm like why the fuck would I want to mow my own lawn? I, I, I like I was like we live a completely different view on the world. Like I don't want to mow my own lawn. I want to pay somebody to do that. But it was and she was from Ohio actually, so maybe that mm, was uh, that was the problem. Something in the water there. I think it is kind of that. <laughs> I, I can see it though. Like I grew up in kind of more a, a middle class like. Um, uh, you know, those damn hippies in California who want soft lives, screw those people, you're supposed to suffer, work is supposed to be a thing you just actually, so that's how I grew up is that work is supposed to be a thing you hate doing. If you don't hate mm -hmm. doing it, then you're doing something wrong. And that's not okay. Was that what was the attitude towards work that you grew up with? I mean, it sounds like your dad had more of a working class kind of job. And you saw like the factory kind of thing. Do you think it was similar? Yeah, um, I don't know if it was hate, but it was like work is supposed to be hard. And yeah. you get paid X amount of dollars per hour and you work hard to make yeah. that kind of money. Mm -hmm. uh, like my mom, similar, like my mom was a preschool teacher and then she worked for like the Head Start program and she was a waitress for a couple of years. So like very blue collar kind of yeah. not making a whole lot of money kind of jobs. Uh, but yeah, they, they both had very similar, I would say, thoughts around money of like, you have to work. Like when I, when I, I remember coming home from college and being like on my computer when I was doing the affiliate stuff and my mom just couldn't understand why i was always on the computer she's like <laughs> trying to get me off the she's like, you need to get off the computer blah, blah, blah. you need to go do something but i'm like no i'm like working like yeah. just didn't grasp that concept whatsoever that you could make money through just the like internet being on your computer just like yeah. doing that yourself and not having an actual job where you're going and hating every single moment of every single thing that you do you yeah know? what do you think um <clears throat> What advice I'm, I'm, I'm digging i'm digging these questions oh yeah dude i'm all about the interesting questions that's what i'm always yeah, you get out. i do i do zero prep for these things then it's a matter of just kind of <laughs> trying to figure out where things are. oh here's the question i wanted to ask you actually back to your mom stuff like when you started making money how did she react was she i mean she would kind of told you hey don't go in this direction do this other thing was she proud of you was she angry that you had succeeded despite her in some way what do you think happened with that so the first time I ever kind of got a thing where she, a sense of that she was actually proud of me. And that what I did was, I think it was 2015. Uh, I had an article in Forbes written about me. Yeah, I remember uh, that. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. So the woman who did it, it was doing this whole series on like one person business owners. And uh, she interviewed me and Lewis Howes and Tim Ferriss, a bunch of people. And that, when that got published, my mom saw that and that was the that was the first time she ever realized like what I was doing was legit and that I actually was like doing well. Um, 
her interesting and how that external credibility is what yeah it's like for my mom like actually my, my people ask my mom what i do and she'll say i don't really know but i know he's very good at it that's generally her response but like when i was on the rachel ray show that was like for her friends like that she's she's she dined out on that for like five years after <laughs> I was on the rachel ray. yeah my I, interestingly my i remember my mom and my grandma at the time took that article it was only online it wasn't in the actual like print but yeah. Uh, my grandma like printed it out and carried it around our small town for like three weeks, like showing it to everybody at the bank and everybody at the restaurant that she eats at. And like, this is my grandson, Justin, like, um, but yeah, that, that, that I would say was probably the first time she had ever kind of said that she was like, I don't even know, but maybe not proud, but like surprised and oh, I'm glad you're doing well. And, uh, she sounds like she, and again, I don't know the woman and whatever else, but she does sound like she has a certain level of narcissism. And sometimes people who are parents who are narcissists, when they see their children succeed, they do get excited because they're like, well, I did that. It's about me. Oh, it's yes. About, yeah, that, so that's that, was, that was the next point I was going to get to. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right to me, having spent yeah. a lot of my life studying these kind of things and how those kind of personalities tend to tend to work. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much how it worked. Me, me being successful was made her look good yep. kind of in front of the friends and all of that so yeah that's, that's kind of how that went what do you think has been the what was what do you think was the biggest downside to becoming successful in your 30s mm. i would say so one of the big things was I would, like I said, I always had a chip on my shoulder, felt kind of incomplete and worthless and struggled with all that. And always had, had the hope that, okay, if I build this business and sell it, or I make a bunch of money, that's going to fill that. Yeah. And I still remember like when I got the bank transfer for, from Alan, multiple seven figures, Yep. had a moment of dopamine and a lot of happiness. And then the next day, like looking at the bank account with all these numbers in it and like, I feel just as unfulfilled yep. as I did yesterday, yep. uh, which is a really hard pill to swallow because it's, it's even like, worse because you still feel like shit, but you, but you're like, I'm not supposed to anymore. I did it. I did it. I have the thing. Why am I not happy? Yeah. Well, yeah. And I spent so long chasing this goal thinking it was going to be that thing that made me happy and like women are going to be throwing themselves at me. And it's just like, not, none of that happens. Well, if you're rich and people know women do throw themselves at you, but not women you want to throw themselves at you. And then you can't trust anybody, right? Like it's, uh, I, I always find it interesting. It's also, you know, this too, like the people that are the flashiest with their money are never as rich as they say they are. The richest yeah. people I know are the ones you would have no fucking clue whatsoever, ever basically. Right. But I always see these guys who are like flashing, you know, with their giant watches and shit. And I'm like, you can't trust anybody. If you're doing that, that girl at the bar who was talking to you does not like you. She doesn't care about you. She just knows you've got some cash. Like it's, it can be really, uh, having it known that you are like in that. Cause again, I have the Rachel Ray thing. So it was like mainstreamy fame to a certain degree that can really fucking fuck with you, man. Yeah. I'm not I have no, for, for any guys listening who think getting rich is going to solve all their problems with women. Yeah. I could tell you, like, if you're out at a bar, it makes no difference whether you're got $10 million or $10. Yeah. There's no, nothing. It's not going to change a damn thing. Um, the only thing I have seen that changes is um, I host a decent amount of like parties and stuff at my house. That definitely changes things. So, oh, like, people in a, come over and they see that you have a nice place and like, yeah, you have a nice house and a bunch of friends and like you're kind of the center of attention. That yeah. kind of shifts the whole perspective on things. Oh, but, yeah. The idea that a lot of guys had, which I would say I definitely had it growing up where it was like, okay, once you get rich, like all the women are just going to throw them. Like, uh, yeah, no, that doesn't happen. No. And the women that do do that are not the ones that you want to have around anyway. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. What's your, um, I have no, you like a personal question, but are you dating anybody at this point? Is that something you, do you want to have kids or like, or what's your goal now as far as the personal side of life? So I would say probably about a year ago, I started to get, a little more serious, but so I've been just kind of casually dating for, yeah. I don't know, four or five years. Yeah. Uh, we and kind of hit about this a few years ago. We like, we had a, a talk like three or four years ago. We talked a lot about this kind of thing a little bit. Yeah. yeah I think I remember when we were at Mike's house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I would say probably a year ago, I got kind of hit the point where I was like, eh, I'm kind of tired of the casual thing and yeah. looking for something more serious. Um, but it's been interesting now because like casual, it's like, 
okay am i attracted to her is she fun to be with cool that's kind of like what only things that matter now when i'm looking more like long term the amount of things i'm like filtering for is it's kind of eye-opening because it's like i don't know like there, there was a girl i was dating last summer who I, I i was really attracted to we had fun uh probably went out i don't know for six weeks or so yeah. uh one thing that popped up was like she was just absolutely horrible with money like oh yeah just yeah. spent money like there was no tomorrow and i'm like thinking of this i was like shit i've never like thought of this before in terms of dating but like i would not be okay with that in a long-term relationship like that's a that's a pretty big red flag it's pretty tough too um, because oftentimes if you're the person male or female who's making the money and then you're with somebody who doesn't make the money <laughs> it's a very different attitude right like my ex my ex was very much like much, much spendier than i am but i'm like dude i worked hard for that shit. i don't just want to spend it on crap i want to keep that for the future it mean it means a different thing to me yeah so i mean that's a big one for me i actually don't have any interest in having kids um mm -hmm. For me, it's one of those things, like I'm open to the idea that that could possibly change, sure. but I also don't want to string along some woman and give her hope yeah, that like yeah. this is going to change because I'm, I'm much more like, yeah, it might change, but I don't know. I'm 38 now and everybody kept telling me when you're older, you don't want kids and yeah. it's, I still don't. So I, I don't really know. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like long term stuff, though, that's that's a deal breaker, obviously, for a lot of women. Absolutely. Um, I was so incredibly happy when Angie and I got together and she didn't want children. It was just, it was like, I, yeah. I literally did a fist pump and she did the exact same thing. Cause we were like, fuck yes. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. It's great when you find somebody who's on the same page as you are on those things. Do you think, um, when you were growing up, did you always kind of assume you'd have kids, you know, growing up in Ohio? No, no, honestly, like, like the idea of it, like sometimes I'll think about like me and the kid like out in the street skateboarding or throwing a football. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. But then like when I'm actually around kids, like my friends that have kids, like the minute to minute. Oh, it's hard. Yeah. Of like taking care of the kids and seeing how much attention like I, it just drives me, yeah, drives me crazy. And I'm like, I don't that part I don't actually want. And then I also I mentioned I have Crohn's disease, so yeah. I wouldn't actually want to have a child myself. And pass that on to them, yeah, because uh, there'd be like a seventy percent chance they would get it. Uh, That's how so I have to... my bipolar. Honestly, I'm like I'm not going to put any child through that kind of anguish unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a big big kind of burden where I'm like, so I, I mean I would have to adopt anyways, and then that's less appealing sure. than having my own kids. I've kind of realized I don't know think for me like I'm a huge dog lover, and I think just dogs are like kind of my level of responsibility that I'm yeah. I'm kind of cool with. It's good that you know that, right? Like, I hate when I hear people who kind of force themselves into having children or kind of <laughs> fitting a mold that, you know, whether, whatever religion they're part of or whatever family they're part of kind of has this idea this is what you're supposed to do. My mom finally gave up on wanting children from me about five, six years ago. And then I got a vasectomy three years ago. And I was like, I, I even, I actually right. sent her like the receipt from the clinic. And I was like, just so you know, mom, it's definitely not happening now. <laughs> It's interesting whenever I write about it, I've written about it to my email list a couple of times mentioning that like I don't want kids and I get so many responses yeah. of like people who are obviously parents who yeah. love their kids and they write this huge thing trying to convince me to have kids. Yeah, it's weird. And I'm like, and they're like, oh, you don't know what you're missing, blah, blah, blah. And all that. But I'm also like, yeah, but I'm pretty adamant that I don't want kids. And yeah. like if someone who doesn't want kids has kids, you're going to fuck that kid up. Absolutely. really really bad absolutely i agree with you i think it's really really and i'm like i'm i'm not it's not worth the risk that like everybody's like oh yeah but once you have them your mind will change it's like yeah but what if it doesn't yeah and that actually does happen i, I have i know people actually i have a, a from from friends i know where the guy like after you know the, the woman that was like hey i really want to have a baby and he was like i never really thought about having a baby but i love you and i'll do it and he assumed he was going to fall in love with the kid when it was born and he did not and it was a real problem. Now they're divorced and it's, it's a whole situation because Oof. that thing did not happen. And that poor child, beautiful child and his mom is great, but it just looks brutal to me. Brutal. It um, is weird though, because like, I've never gone around trying to convince people not to have children, right? It's not like people that don't have children, like go and find young people, like whatever you do, don't have kids, but people that do have kids really seem to want to like recruit people into their particular way of life. It seems strange to me. I, I've noticed that with my email list, that, and then anything around like religion and politics, yep. I get the, get the same thing with people like, 
I'm pretty open that I'm very like in the middle libertarian. I'm like liberal on social issues, conservative on fiscal things. I believe in freedom kind of above everything else. Yeah. And everyone from like both sides, like tries to convince me like that I need to move to that side and their way is right. And I was like, no, I like this. This is kind of what I believe. Like, yeah, it seems like a pretty good place to be, honestly. Overall, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, I, I gave up on trying to convince anybody of anything around politics quite some time ago. What I do now is I I tell people I'm like, listen, I'm gonna post what I want to post, and if you reply, you can reply. I don't want to have a conversation with you about this, but if you insist, I still will not have a conversation with you about it. But I will start making fun of you a lot in front of people until you go away, and so that's what I do. I just mock them viciously until they go away. It's it's fun. It's a good time. I enjoy it. Yeah. Nice. I, like it. I was impressed when I went to ClickBank. I was really concerned at ClickBank there were going to be an overwhelming number of like right wing whatever people at it. And there were not. I was very pleased to pleased to discover. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I was shocked. It's like, oh, most people are actually quite reasonable here. It's weird. Well, shit, man, it's been a bit over an hour now. This has been super fun. Um, congratulations on, on the congratulations on this next phase of whatever you're doing. I'm really excited to see kind of what you end up doing next and it is an admirable thing and a rare thing to see somebody who's just like yeah i've got the money side pretty well handled and i don't need to have some crazy lifestyle and i don't need to throw money around and impress people i'm just going to get what i need and live my life and see what happens next it is an admirable and awesome thing thank you man i appreciate that yeah i would highly encourage everyone listening to kind of give that some thought as to kind of like what your end game is because i think that's a that's a big thing where it's like, do you really just want to make a ton of money? Do you want to sell a business? Uh, are you more like lifestyle based? Because different things really appeal to different people. Um, and if you don't really have a clue, clue or an idea as to like kind of what that end game really is for you, uh, you're kind of just wandering like a the, the you, ship sailing in the getting, night. You know, you might end up having the experience you had where you wake up one day and you've got millions in the bank and you're miserable because that wasn't really the goal of what you were striving for. You yep. didn't really know what you were. For me, it's like I'm 44 now and I'll be 45 in a few months and I'm getting closer to 50 and it makes me think about like, okay, I'll probably make it to my 70s somewhere. But like, what am I, if I spend all of that time trying to make a fuck ton of money, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> like, I'm not going to be here for that long anyway. It's mostly for safety. Um, okay, cool. Thank you again. Thank you so much, man. It's been super fun having you on. And uh, for folks, folks who are listening, do me a favor, shoot me an email at chris at thechrishaddadshow.com. Let me know how you liked the episode and how much you love listening to Justin's extremely low voice the entire time. <laughs> uh, go over to Spotify, go over to Apple um, Podcasts, leave me a review, leave us a review. Uh, it just makes me feel good about myself because otherwise I don't know that you guys are actually listening, even though I see the stats and I know a lot of you are. And that'll be it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and pretend that the show's over now, but we're, I'm still going to talk to Justin for a second. Bye.